I'm going to talk about games in HTML5 for Windows. All right, take it away, Giorgio. Thank you, Joe. Welcome back. Thank you, thank you. Don't, uh, thank you. Thank you. All right, how many of you saw that my session this morning about Windows 8? Woo! Excellent. How many of you like it? Woo! Thank you. Thank you for the support. I love you. I love you. So uh, this session is going to be quite different. Like I've just been defined as a salesman, <laughs> which I hate because I'm a technical guy. And so I'm going to demonstrate I can write code. Uh, no, actually, I'm going to show you. Um, I'm going to build a game from, from scratch, from zero. So I'm going to just crank up and write some code in front of you. So chances that I'm going to make mistakes, 100%. Uh, but since you're smarter than me, you can correct me, and you can just uh, uh, signal me when I'm writing something wrong. Um, and so before we get into the, the code, let's just uh, recap from where we left uh, like the previous session. So this is the Windows 8 platform. Uh, in these next uh, 45 minutes, we're going to focus in particular on HTML5 applications on Windows which means that we have these two components, right? We have HTML and JavaScript, and then we have the Windows runtime. HTML and JavaScript is exactly what you see in the browser. So we have exactly the same engine of uh, the standard engine, hardware accelerated of IE 10, is also available to write applications. And we, um, the, the engine that powers the application is the same performance of the browser. So differently from other platforms where you might get different performance, we just give you all the capabilities there for you in, in order to build apps. And this is just a short list of the, some of the standards that are, are supported. Um, in terms of Windows runtime, this is like where Windows 8 comes in. And this is like an additional layer of APIs that are provided through JavaScript and that can, can allow you to connect through, to the memory, to the cache, to the media, to devices, uh, sensors, uh, to more advanced graphic stuff. So we'll, we'll use all of this together, but now let's write some code. How many of you are familiar with Preacher Studio? Excellent. Good, good amount of you. And so this is Visual Studio. This is just my uh, developer tools. So everything I'm using today is, is, is free. Um, and I'm going to uh, create a new project. And notice that I'm going to create a new web project, not a Windows 8 project. I want to start with uh, just a normal web template. And the reason is that because it's HTML5 code, I don't need to build anything specific for Windows here. Like, it can just be standard HTML5 code. So I'm going to just create a page. Let's call it HTML page. And then I'm going to create, actually, I'm going to write some script. So I have my script tag. And inside my script tag, I'm just going to start with some basic plumbing that we will use. Uh, so notice that I'm using uh, ECMAScript five use strict so that uh, Visual Studio and the tools will correct me if I make any mistake. Uh, we are connecting to the DOM content loaded, so when the DOM is ready to parse, we initialize the game. Um, and then we are ready to start. So this is going to be the base for our game. And now we're just going to write code on top of it and feature by feature. Are you interested to see, not the black ops, but are you interested to see, um, actually, I'll, I'll show you what the final game will be, will look like. Ba -ba -ba. So this is how the final game is going to look like. So I'm a Yeti, and I need to hit uh, the, the zombies, and then I win. Okay, so we're going to build this in the next half an hour or so. Do you like it? Yes, okay. thank you, thank you, thank you. You can be the Yeti if you want. All right, and so we're going to start from, from here, basic page. Uh, I decided that this game I want to build using the canvas. You don't, have to, you don't have to use the canvas. You can use SVG, you can use DOM. But for these games, we will use a canvas. So I'm just going to create a canvas document, call it uh, canvas, uh, set the width to 13668. And then we're just going to get uh, the canvas here. So bar canvas, context, canvas, document, uh, get element by D, canvas. So this is just basic stuff. You can ask me questions if, uh, if you want me to, to stop, but I assume that this is just something that, uh, that you actually see every day. Uh, canvas, get uh, context. Actually, it's not this. It's, uh, voila, 2D. OK? Then the next step is that we need to get an image. And so just for the purpose of time, I'm going to drop, I have here a number of uh, assets we can use for the game. So I'm just going to drop these assets inside my web folder. And then we're going to create a function. Let's call it uh, 
draw inside my function I'm just going to draw that image so we take an image we create a new image dynamically image source equal assets let's say sky dot png and then we draw it on the canvas so context dot draw image image zero zero everybody's following is, is this going to work is it correct yes no yeah, 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 shoot, it didn't. It doesn't work. Why? Well, at this point, right, like think about like the, 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 the engine. We are dynamically pulling the image from, from, from my package, from the front resources, and then I'm immediately drawing to the canvas. But when I'm drawing to the canvas, the image is not ready yet. And so what you need to do is you need to listen for the image to be ready. So we can do this just by adding an event listener to the load event. And then once the image is ready, da, 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 we draw it on the screen. And so with this little change, now I'm ready to draw the image. Okay? Little trick, but this is something that you need to do when you load dynamically the resources. And then there is another problem. You notice the scroll bar? You know, I define the image as a 1366. Now I need to resize the image for my specific uh, screen ratio. And so there are different patterns here. There are different uh, techniques to, to scale assets. You have the scale transform as part of the canvas specification. You have the scale transform as part of the CSS specification. What I'm going to use here is a new uh, approach that we, we just submitted for standardiza standardization to W3C, which is called viewport. And so let's create uh, um, CSS uh, group here, and I'm going to drop here a few lines of uh, CSS, and in particular, the one that is interesting is this, viewport. It's prefixed MS, obviously, because this standard is still uh, something that we're discussing in W3C. But this allows you to say as developer, I know exactly the, the, the resolution of my game, which is 1366, 768. You, user agent, you, browser, take care of scale it for me. And so if we run again exactly the same page, now you can see that as I resize the browser, it just rescale everything that is inside to meet the same aspect ratio. And eventually, if I go full screen, it's just a full screen image. Or it should be. So maybe I didn't write something correctly here, 366. Uh, no, no, it's correct. Yes, yeah, a full screen image. OK, everything clear so far? Do you like this property? Yeah. Yeah. This saves a lot of work, right? You are a quiet uh, audience. We can get rid of the property if you don't like it, <laughs> right? We, we thought we would do uh, something good for web developers implementing it. And so now we have an image, long way to go. So how can we now load multiple images, right? We need to preload a lot of images into the game. Well, one way is just to take this and copy and paste this uh, for each g uh, image of the game. Let's do something a little bit smarter. So I'm going to encapsulate this code inside the variable. Let's call it uh, add image function. Then I'm going to pass the source. Okay. And then instead of setting this, I change this to the source. And then I call my add image. And I pass my argument. Then the other thing I want to do is uh, I need to return the uh, image tag. Okay. And then I also will need to uh, save that uh, image somewhere. So I'm just going to create a number of variables. Those are just the uh, standard variable. And then I'm going to say, OK, preload the image and then save that image inside my sky function. And so if now I take this and I call it sky, it should just work like it did before. No, it doesn't. Where's the error? Do, do, do. Oh, here's the error. Again, we're making the same mistakes. We are not ready to, 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 to draw the image yet, right? Because we need to wait for this event listener. And so what we will do, we will create a variable here, and we call it uh, preload, and we set it to 0. And then every time I add an image, I increment the variable. And then every time the image is ready, is loaded into the DOM, I decrement the variable. Right? Little trick like this. And then I create another function and I call it uh, var check uh, resources. Ta -ta. And then I say, if my preload equals zero, then I'm ready to draw. So I will say draw loop. 
Otherwise, wait a few, set them out. So let's wait a few seconds and then a few milliseconds and then let's check again if I'm ready. And so at this point I call check resources and when check resources is ready, we will call the draw loop. So we create a new function, Ta -ta, draw loop and inside the draw loop I put the sky. So if now I wrote everything correctly, it will draw the sky. Yes. Did you get it? Am I going too fast? Am I going too fast? Is it okay? Is it the right level of uh, technical depth that you want? Yes? Great. Love it. And of course, now I can do this very easily, right? For adding other images, you can, you can just uh, add many more resources here. So I'm just going to add uh, my blurb and I'm preloading other images. So now we are done. We have preloaded all of the images for the game and we can just uh, think about drawing. So I have my drawing sky. Then the next thing I want to draw is the draw the mountain. And so now I'm just starting to uh, overlay a different image on top of each other. We can get rid of this. Excellent. Next step. Next step. What do we do next? Let's draw a. What do we draw? Let me see what we can draw. I have a few notes here, just to remember. I'm drop, dropping notes. Let's draw an animation, right? We have some static uh, context into the canvas. Let's draw some animation. And in particular, I want to draw little zombies. You know, you saw the, the walking zombies, right? And so how do animation work in, uh, in HTML5? I have a little video that shows how the animation works. Like, th this is a very basic concept. Um, let's see if it plays. Here's how the canvas works for animation. You quickly, you know, uh, loop iterate through a number of frames, and the fact that each frame is slightly different from the other gives to the user the idea that uh, that's an animation. This is the concept of uh, just like most of the games that you see today are using this technique. Do you, uh, are you already building games, by the way? Do you already have experience building games? Yes? No? Some of you? This is a very common pattern, right? You just very quickly iterate through, through a lot of images. And so this is exactly what we're going to do uh, with, uh, with our game. And so if, you, if we look at the assets that I just copied into the folder, you can see, for example, my zombie, right? It's made of three steps, and each step is slightly different. It's like step one, step two, step three, right? And then if you animate it quickly, it's like it's walking. And so we're just going to animate very quickly through, through those. And so ba -ba -ba, let's go back to our code. I'm going to create a, a variable here, and I'm going to call it uh, uh, draw zombies. And then let's create a function, let's call it draw zombies. In order to draw zombies, I need to add the zombies. And so I'm just going to have here like an array of zombies. This is beautiful. And I'm going to call this function from my init. So add zombies. What the array does, I'm just populating randomly an array of zombies and putting them in random positions. So I'm just setting a X, Y coordinate and assigning one of the sprites that I preloaded initially. And then inside my draw zombies function, you can get rid of this. Here's some code and let's go through the code uh, line by line. I'm going to iterate through uh, each of the zombies in my array. I'm going to take the sprite. This is just an image that I have read in memory. And then I'm going to take the canvas and I'm going to say draw image and let me explain you this, actually, this concept with a slide. This is the syntax of the canvas. This is the syntax of draw image. This is a key function that you will need to use a lot in the games. You have a lot of parameters. The first parameter is the image. It's the source that you want to draw. The next four parameters are the source of like, the rectangle from that image that you want to pick. And the next uh, four parameters are the destination of the rectangle. So basically, you can say, I have that large sprite. I take only that little uh, rectangle on the right, and then I draw it and I rescale it at this position with this ratio, et cetera, et cetera. And so this is the magic function that does it for you. And so if we look at the code here, I'm just using exactly that function where I have my source, the, the image sprite, and then I'm setting a little trick to uh, pick like the x, y coordinates, and then I'm just setting the sprite. You see like the width divided by three because I'm just taking a third of that uh, larger image and I draw it in, the, uh, in a destination in front of my, uh, inside my canvas. As I'm looping through the zombies, 
I'm also incrementing the position of each zombie by five uh, pixel, and I'm multiplying that by the for the direction. So the direction is just a plus minus one, so that the, when the zombie arrives to the side, it kind of bounces and it changes direction, right? This is the code that is cha it changes the direction when I'm meeting one of the two uh, edges. There is one more thing that we need to do here, which is how do we tell the canvas to continue to draw uh, many times? How do we create this concept of frames? And so you see here I have a frame variable. So let's create this frame variable. And let's call it, let's say we have an initial value of zero. And then when I'm inside the draw loop, every time I go through the draw loop, I increment the frame by, let's say, 0.1. And in order to loop uh, by himself, I use a function called request animation frame. Request animation frame is a new function that basically allows you to do uh, graphic animations. In the past, you probably used, uh, w what are the, 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 the functions that you use in the past in JavaScript to do loops? Set, set interval or set timeout, right? Those are the two functions that you always use. What's the challenge with set interval? With set interval, you say, hey, browser, every 16 milliseconds, call my function. But the reality is that the graphic card, the GPU, might be busy at the time, might be doing something else. And so it kind of like it's very random the way you are drawing into the screen. And so request animation frame is a new standard. It's already a, a, a recommendation at W3C. And allow you to say, ask the browser, basically. You ask the browser, browser, when you're ready to draw, when the GPU is free and you're ready to draw, call me back. I give you the code to draw, and then you draw. And so basically, you're saving a lot of CPU cycle and GPU cycle. This is going to improve performance of your games. It's going to improve the performance of the, like, the battery life, because you're just drawing when the GPU is ready to draw. Um, and, and your animation is going to be very smooth. And in this case, I'm just going to loop through the drawing loop uh, continually. And I'm doing it only when I'm ready to, ex to, to draw the next step. So again, if we now replay my application, there it is. We see the zombies that are bouncing on the sides and then are just changing direction. And this is as easy, uh, like the animations are as easy as this. Cool? Did you ever thought it was so easy to build a game? <laughs> you know, when you think now about Cut the Rope, about uh, the Disney game, about the Angry Birds, these are the techniques that they use, right? They're not different. It's that easy. So if you have good assets and you have good imagination for creating a game, it's very simple to create a game. All right, so now we have the game. And the next step is we have the zombies, but we still need to create the, the, the Yeti. And so let's get into the Yeti thing. Um, the Yeti, first of all, will need to uh, follow my finger, right? So I want that when I move the finger on the screen or when I move the mouse, the Yeti move uh, left, right. So let's set up the code to, to target the, the input. So set up uh, input. Then we go to the bottom. And I should have already a snippet for this. OK, set up input. I'm going to take my document, body, at event listener. I'm, I'm going to listen for pointer move. I spent a couple of words on this. Pointer is a new specification for touch, for handling touch. Um, historically, uh, there haven't been a good way, a standard way to handle touch in the browser. Apple came up with uh, APIs like uh, touch uh, start, uh, touch move, touch end. But those were proprietary, only up working on <coughs> Apple. Uh, there was lot, the feedback we got from developers was there was a delay. They were not optimized. It was kind of weird to use them. Do you have experience using the touch APIs from Apple? No, but trust me, like we, we the develop, like it was good because it was the only option, uh, but the developer feedback was not so, so uh, uh, consistently good. And so we've been working with W3C uh, to create a new standard for touch. And we actually gave years of work that we've done internally at Microsoft as a specification to W3C. And now this is actually, there is a working group at W3C to specific for touch. And this is the specification that they're working on. So we already implemented the specification in uh, IE, IE10 for Windows 8, IE10 uh, for Windows 7, and uh, IE10 for my Windows phone. So it's already available on all of these devices. And the concept is very simple. Instead of thinking, let's handle the code for touch. Let's handle the code for the mouse. Let's handle the code for the pen. We created this concept of pointer where you as developer, you just set up one code base for the pointer, and then the user agent knows how to handle the pointer depending on what input the user is using. 
which means that in this case, I'm just listening for the pointer move and the pointer up. And now it doesn't matter if I'm using the finger or if I'm using the mouse, the user agent will be able to react to, to that. And so you notice that as I move the finger, for example, around the screen, as I trigger a mouse move, I'm going to save the position in the screen. So let's uh, uh, store that variable, let's call it pointer x. And then as I raise it up, I'm going to create a new ball. Actually, let's comment this for now. So what, I do, what do I do with the pointer? Well, I need to draw the Yeti, and I want the Yeti to follow my finger. So let's create that, uh, that Yeti. Uh, draw Yeti. Actually, I'm going to hide it behind the mountains. Right? It's important the order you specify when you draw, because each, each image will go on top of the previous one. And then let's go here at the bottom. <coughs> and let's create my draw yeti function. So the draw yeti is going to use exactly the same technique, canvas, draw an image at the position of the pointer, okay? So let's run this again in the browser. And now as I move around the mouse, hoo -hoo, it's following, <laughs> right? I have the yeti under my finger. But it's still not throwing the ball, so the next step is I want the, tro the, the yeti to uh, to throw the ball uh, down to the, to the zombies. Da, da, da. So in order to throw the ball, uh, let's say that when I click, for example, on the Yeti, I create a new ball. So I basically have now an array of balls, and I'm just going to set the initial position where the Yeti, where, where, where I clicked. And then I need to create, obviously, a function to draw the ball. So here's my function, draw balls. Uh, the function will take the array of balls, actually we need to create that array, bar balls equal new array. And then it's going to take each ball and it's going to just draw it at the coordinates that are saved. And then it's going to increment this time the Y coordinate. So we basically make the ball going down into the screen by incrementing the Y. So if I run this page again, actually no, and then I need to call the draw balls inside my drawing loop. So drawing loop, uh, draw balls. So now that I run this again, as a result ball, Boom, uh, I'm snowing, it's Christmas ball. But I'm still not hitting, right? Because this, at this point, I'm just drawing on top of it. So how do we handle the, the, the hit detection? Well, these are just images. We're just inside the canvas, so we're just drawing. We need to write a little bit of code to handle the collision and, and to, to handle the hit coll collection. And the best place to add that code is probably here. So as I'm drawing the ball, I want to check at this point if the ball is going to hit an element. And so I have a little function called test collision. What this function does, so I have a, I'm a creating a remove uh, function as a prototype of the array object. This is just going to remove an item at a specific position, so nothing special here. And then the test collision is going to iterate through the list of zombies, okay? And then for each zombies, is going to compare basically the position of the zombie with the position of the ball. And if those two are within the 100 pixel uh, range, then it means that most likely I hit, I hit the ball and I, I hit the zombie. And then I remove the zombie from, uh, from my array. So what we can do, we need to call this test collision for each of the ball that I'm drawing. And so here, inside my drawing loop for the balls, I'm going to say if test collision of uh, the current balls current ball is cos of y, then I have an it. So let's run this again. And now, if everything works correctly, when I hit the zombie, the zombie should disappear. Right? Super simple. And as I hit the zombie, I also want to make some sound. So we didn't talk about sounds yet. Um, sounds are a great thing to do in HTML5. So I'm just going to uh, add uh, an audio tag. And let's call this audio, for example, audio impact. And then the source of the audio, let's set it to, I forgot how I call it, uh, assets.mp3. Uh, Where is it? No. Imp impact mp3. <coughs> so I have my audio file that I add to the, to the DOM. And then when I have a hit here, I'm just going to take my audio file and I'm going to pause it. I'm going to reset the current time to zero. And then I'm going to, oops, sorry. And then I'm going to play. 
why I'm using this uh, little technique of pause at the current time to zero and then play? Because this time, like this way, I can play uh, the same audio files many times. And if the, the same audio file is already playing, I kind of reset it and then I play it again. Uh, so now that we hit the, the zombies, we should hear, right? Look, a good I am I. I can have multiple hit in one. Ah, yes. Come on, die. <laughs> That's it. Because now we're getting uh, you know, closer to the full game. So I think we did this in uh, 15 minutes, 20 minutes. What do you think? Yeah. <laughs> right. Now, I don't pretend this will ever be a huge hit, but it shows you like, how easy it is to get started with games. We have the game running in the browser. Now, how do we port this into a Windows 8 application? Like, let's, let's think about that experience now. So first step, as we did this morning, we're just going to create Visual Studio, open a new project, create a new template. So I'm going to use a JavaScript template for uh, Windows 8 apps. And exactly like we did this morning, it's exactly the same uh, process. I'm going to take all of the files that I just wrote, so those two files, and I'm going to drop them inside my uh, Windows 8 template. And then I'm going to set the start page to be how do we call it? Uh, HTML page. So if I run on my local machine and everything works, we should just be able to see, boom, the full game running in Windows 8. Okay? And you notice that because I'm rescaling to the maximum size, you, this is the experience that I was talking about. Like this is the game, that, the experience that you want to create, a full screen uh, canvas that occupy all, all of the space, all of the real estate on the screen. But of course, like right now it's just just the game, right? So what can we do with Windows 8 to light this up a bit on, on Windows 8? Well, the first thing, let's start from the tile. If you look at the tile, this is right now the tile of my game. It's a very boring icon. How do we make that icon more, more attractive? In the property, in the manifest, you can, like, da, da, da. You can see that there, is, uh, there are a number of properties like small logos, uh, white logo, logo, etc. And this is where you can easily customize the, the, the images and, uh, and the assets. And so again, I have actually the assets already here. So I'm going to go into games, uh, images, and I have a few assets that we're going to use. And I'm going to drop those inside the images folder. Going to replace the existing assets. So if I go inside the white logo and I select this, mm -mm. set it as white logo. Oh, what's wrong? Visual Studio is smart enough to recognize the size. It probably is telling me that uh, I didn't pick the right size. Didn't I? Let's try it with this. OK, let's see this in action. And now I have that, the, a nice tile here. And eventually, I can make it larger. OK, so first step, create a beautiful, attractive uh, tile. And it's easy as just uh, adding an image. Next step, uh, I actually want to think also about the, the menu, the navigation. How do you navigate into the game from you know, a menu where you present like a different, uh, different options? And so let's go back to our default page. So let's start actually from the default page. Ta default. And then inside my default page, I'm going to create a link. And that link is what is going to take me to the, to the next page. So I'm going to call this link uh, uh, href equal uh, HTML page dot HTML. I'm going to call this class equal start game button. And then inside the CSS of this page, I'm going to drop a few lines of CSS here. Let's take a look. First, I'm going to set a background image. Then I'm going to take that uh, start game button, and I'm just going to set up some style, set up some background uh, color. And I'm also going to set up an animation. So you can see here that I have an animation, and I'm using CSS3 animations to, to animate. Um, with this little animation, as I run the game, you see this, like pulsing uh, image. It's just a CSS image on top of a, like, uh, so CSS uh, animation applied to an image. But it gives you the idea that this is interactive, right? And as a, as a click start game, then I'm uh, uh, projecting into, into my main game. So just a little bit of fun of with, uh, with CSS as well. And then the next 
step is to manage the snap view, right? If I run this game now, and if I try to snap it into the side, well, it doesn't quite work. So I need to handle uh, the state where I'm in, uh, in the snap mode. And it's super easy to do using just, again, other CSS3 um, property called um, media queries. And so the media queries allow you to query the string and get an event basically when uh, the size of the screen change. And we have a particular property, view state equals snapped, that tells you when you are in a snap mode. And so when we are in a snap mode, I'm just going to change the background, like for the sake of this uh, presentation, I'm just going to change the background and do some other stuff. So let's try this when I'm in snap mode. I, in this case, for example, showing an image, but you can think about showing uh, a different UI for the game, showing results, showing the leaderboards, uh, showing a, a smaller version of the game, right? You can be as creative as, uh, as you want. By the way, you're seeing that I'm doing all of this just using Visual Studio. If you feel more comfortable uh, inspecting the code uh, visually, then you can open up another tool called Blend that comes as part of uh, the Visual Studio family. And Blend allows you to do something very powerful, allows you to draw the game and design the game and at the same time run it like in real time. And so you could say, let's preview and let's, let's design the, the, like my view in this mode. And you can even say, you know, right now all the content is, is uh, interactive here, but you could say, let's go into the live mode, right? So I'm going to turn on live. I'm going to click start game. And now I'm playing the game inside my tool. And then I say, okay, I want to edit something here. And you go outside of the, of the live and now you can edit uh, uh, the, the, the content also in, uh, in, uh, in live mode. All right, so let's get rid of this. The last thing I want to share, I want to show you, is how to implement <coughs> the share contract. So let's go inside, the, uh, inside my game. Actually, no, let's go inside here. And we're going to add a little snippet to uh, support the, the share contract that I showed you this morning. So the ability for the, sh the game uh, to share context. So here's the little snippet. Init uh, share. And init share is going to use uh, one of the Windows runtime APIs. So I'll go more slowly here. This, this is something new for you, most of you. The Windows Runtime APIs are a set of JavaScript APIs that we provide to Windows 8 developers to access the, the, the operating system, the APIs, the sensors, or the capabilities. In this case, I'm going to use the Data Transfer Manager, and I'm going to listen for the event data requested, and then I'm going to provide a context about what I want to share about this game. So Yeti, play the game, Yeti, beautiful game, whatever. You can share text, you can share images, you can share links, and Let's see what happens like when I run this game. So I'm previewing the game, going to the game. I'm very happy about my game. Now I want to share, so I bring the share contract. And now Windows knows that the game is sharing this context and allows me to send the content basically to any of the applications that I have installed. And so for example, in this, uh, uh, in this case is my mail application and I just uh, show in like how to share to mail or it could be any other application that I have installed. So it's that easy to create that share contract and, and to uh, hook up your, your, operate, your application inside the operating system. And the very last thing I want to show you is how to use the sensors. Um, in this case, we're running on a tablet, but the same game as is, like without the need to change anything, will also work on all of the, um, so we're running on a laptop, but the game will also work on any tablets. And so the tablets eventually could have an accelerometer input. So I will show you here the code snippet that takes to init accelerometer. So I said that you want to uh, connect to the accelerometer. Again, you have a JavaScript API starting from the Windows runtime. You get the sensors accelerometer. You're listening for the reading changed event. And then you take the accelerometer and you convert that into a position. And as you flip around uh, the tablet, it will just follow your mouse. Sorry, follow your uh, accelerometer. And so in... Uh, Phew, this was a rush. In uh, half an hour, we just built a game in HTML5. We ported to Windows 8. We added the share. We added uh, a nice looking tile. We talked about the accelerometer. And this is how beautiful and fun and easy it is to write games for Windows 8. <laughs> Am I still a salesman? <laughs> you just saw me on switching to Windows 8, so I don't know. <laughs> Now, we, do we have time left? 
Absolutely. I actually went a bit faster towards the end. I'd love to take questions. I know that you have a lot of things in your mind, so I'd love to take any question or answer anything that you want to know about Windows 8, HTML5, i10, myself, my life, what I will do tomorrow, what I did yesterday, anything. Any question? questions? Yes. Just now in your last quote snippet, you show the uh, usage of the accelerometer. Okay. And I understand that I... I understand that there's actually, if I'm not wrong, an uh, API, standard API for the accelerometer, but it seems that you're using a different one. Is there any reason for that? You understand that there is a different API for? The accelerometer, a standard API for accelerometer. So the question is, is there a standard API for accelerometer? Uh, and the answer is no, there isn't a standard. There are different approaches, I think from Mozilla, maybe from Google, to end the accelerometer. None of this is a standard, so they're just propose, proposal, uh, or they're just like, proprietary implementations. It's an area where, you know, like devices in general, not just accelerometer. Uh, devices is an area where W3C is investing a lot. Uh, touch is an example of an area where in the past we didn't have anything and now we have a, a good specification to, to discuss and to, to, to continue. Accelerometer, sensors in general is another area that will continue to, uh, to be discussed at W3C. We implemented it as part of the, the Windows runtime because the level of APIs and accuracy that we have today was not available yet as part of that, uh, uh, the specification you probably saw. Uh, but longer term, I wouldn't be surprised if this is something that will fit into the, the standards world longer in, in the next years. That's a great question. You have the transition from the start button to the game, right? Uh -huh. So I could see there is a split second widescreen, right? That is because the image is loading. So how you can make transition smoother there? So question is, how do I make the transition from one page to the other smoother? So I obviously brought a game in half an hour, and I didn't use all of the best practices that you will need to use as you build a game. There are several techniques there. Uh, the basic one is, um, well, there are games that actually use just one page. So I saw many develop game developers building everything inside the same page, and then pulling resources in and out, or h hiding the resources. That's nice, however, is the disadvantage that you're bringing a lot of elements into the memory, and eventually if your game uses a lot of assets, that's not a good practice to bring too much images into the memory. What I could do here is, you are, we actually provide a way to do that smooth transition. We actually have APIs in CSS that allow you to kind of do either the fading, or to do the overlay on top of it, or to keep a cache. I also should think about how do I use app cache or how do I use other mechanisms to cache the resources locally so that eventually if I'm getting some resources from the network, I don't need to load them all the time. They're just stored locally in my cache and that is going to improve even further the performance. Uh, how can I use maybe the background, right? Between one transition and the other, I could just use a background and, I, and use that as my uh, transitional step. Um, or I could show some spinning wheel. There are different techniques and it really depends on, on the game. Any other questions? Uh, with JavaScript and that canvas, we can uh, develop for like uh, 2D games. So how about 3D games uh, mm -hmm. that mm, have hardware acceleration rendering? Yeah, so the question is, uh, canvas and, HTML and JavaScript are great for 2D games. What about 3D games, right? Um, 3D is an important uh, space. How many of you actually are building 3D games? One, how many, how many of you are building games, like 3D games, for, for the web? One person. Um, how many of you are using HTML and JavaScript or building uh, uh, games in 2D? Okay, M more, more person. <laughs> like, not that, I hope more in the future. Um, but that's the thing, like, when, when we look at uh, the state of, you know, the web for games today, um, HTML and JavaScript is the number one priority. And as a matter of fact, we prioritized like we, we made a super fast engine for the graphic, for the 2D graphic with the canvas, our, our JavaScript that is hardware accelerated, etc. Um, there are other, um, um, how can I say, there are other um, companies working on WebGL, for example, and they are coming up with their own way to do 3D on, uh, on, on their browsers. It's not quite stable yet. Like the, the challenge is that it's not just as easy as saying, oh, I implemented WebGL and it works on, uh, I don't know, Chrome uh, 55. Uh, and you need uh, this great hardware to, to run it. Because the reality is that, can you run WebGL on uh, this iPhone? Which version is this? Four. Four? 
Uh, no. Can you run WebGL on Android, the latest version of Android? Mm, no. And so it's important that, you know, when we think about the technology, we think about, you know, great features for the developers, but also great performance on any device. And so that's why probably the 3D on the web is still a bit behind. Um, today, like, for example, our 3D games in Windows 8 are built using DirectX, which is like technology that has been out there for several years and is proving to be very successful with, with, uh, with Xbox. Great. Anyone else? I have a question, actually. Sure. Um, Microsoft, particularly over the last sort of six, six, eight months, maybe a little longer, has been um, doing a lot of work in the, with the community mm -hmm. trying to get some standardization. Um, yeah, from last, our point last of view, three years. Three, what, four years. The last three, four years. Mm -hmm. We've, we've really noticed it anyway lately. Excellent. So um, how's it going? Because <laughs> well, there's some stuff in there that we want to see standardized, right? You, you tell us, actually. You know, we've been working for a long time with W3C, and we've been ramping up even more the resources and, the, and our uh, cooperation with W3C and other members to make you know, a better web. Uh, I feel very good about where we are in IE10 in terms of standard support, and I feel very good in terms of like, all of the contribution that we made to the standard bodies. Like we talk about the touch, uh, all of, we introduced a lot of performance APIs, we've been working on WAF fonts. There are a lot, lot of standards actually coming from Microsoft over the last years. And we're going to continue actually pushing the boundary of HTML5 or whatever other spec, right? It's either CSS3 or 4 or ECMAScript 6. Like we're working on ECMAScript 6 as well, right? So we're very committed to now a standard web. Excellent, excellent. Uh, let me ask you, what do you think? Is it working well for you? Yeah, excellent, good. So this is the type of feedbacks that uh, we love to hear. All right, let's hear it one more time for right. Giorgio. Thank you.